Good morning. Let us begin. Does anyone have any question before we start today? Any concern? So we are in chapter 13 where we are trying to basically wrap up the discussion of oligopoly. This was a very long chapter because it covered two very interesting and often complicated market structures, the monopolistic competition and oligopoly. Oligopoly specifically is quite interesting in the sense that you have a market where there are few firms who might be producing identical products but yet they enjoy market power. Since there are strong barriers to entry in these kind of industries, sometimes you know, you know, created by the existing firms, sometimes created by the government, oligopoly firms enjoy substantial amount of market power. To make things more complicated, this is a market where firms, the existing firms, are likely to uh, form a collusion between each other. They are likely to uh, you know, come to an agreement where they would uh, you know, jointly determine how much price and how much quantity they are going to produce and thereby oligopoly might look like a monopoly. These firms coming together in a group might actually behave like a monopolist. We also learned that this is a market where firms' decisions are interdependent to each on, on, in a, on each other, which means that if one firm decides to produce more, the other firms will end up having a smaller share of the market pie. So this market, although uh, you know looking very simple in the sense that you have a, set of a bunch of firms, very few of them, dominating the entire market, the internal competition between them is intense. So firms in this kind of oligopolistic market always think strategically. They try to make their own price and output decisions, keeping in mind as to what the other competitors are doing. Collision makes things even more complicated because sometimes the firms might create a collusion among each other. And we, we saw in the last class that although these collusions are good for our firms, very bad for us, but good for our firms because they cannot uh, work like a monopolist, this kind of collusion almost always breaks down because firms do not trust each other. Firms always have a tendency to deviate from the agreed decisions that they made on a joint basis. In order to highlight this strategic interaction between the firms, in order to uh, highlight or you know, explain the reasons behind why firms cheat on each other, we started developing this game theoretic approach. We define game theory as a way to understand strategic interaction between different parties. That could be individuals, that could be firms, that could be even countries. In game theory, we use games to understand how you know, uh, competitors act against each other. And any game theory basically involves playing a game, just like a chess game. And every game will have these three important elements to it. We, every game will have what we call rules that will define how the players are going to interact with each other. There are going to be strategies which will determine the various strategies that these players can play. And then as a combination of rules and strategies, you are going to have what we call payoffs. Payoffs will determine the outcome of certain <coughs> strategic interaction from the game. We will be analyzing those payoffs to determine sometimes whether a firm has an incentive to play one specific strategy all the time. If a firm always plays one strategy all the time, we call that strategy a dominant strategy. We try to highlight the, these features in a so-called prisoner's dilemma where you are basically interrogating two convicts <coughs> trying to make them confess their past crimes, and we found something fascinating. We found that even in this very simple, yet very famous example, these uh, players were working against their own interest. 
the game suggested that if these two contexts were to form a collusion and decide not to confess, meaning that they both deny, they could have ended up with lower sentences, <coughs> two years each. Unfortunately, since they do not uh, trust each other or they do not have any communication device between each other, what will happen is that in this kind of games, firms will end up choosing confess. Both of these players will choose up con confess and that turned out to be a dominant strategy in our previous class. So these were a very interesting way of looking at strategic behavior. Several things stood out in our previous discussion. Number one, strategic interaction is important. Number two, some way of communication between the parties are extremely important. Number three, parties do not trust each other. They always have a tendency to cheat and their desire to cheat their greed makes them worse off. We are going to highlight this even more today by looking at three more additional games. I will not be doing any interest problem because I think looking at each of these games are substantial exposure to the game theory part. After I look at these three games, which should not take me more than 15 minutes, I will move to chapter 14, which will mark the beginning of the macro part of this chapter. So, the, the new game that we are going to play is what, we, uh, what is sometimes called a duopolistic game. A duopolistic game is very much similar to the previous game that we just saw. Uh, it's a game played between two players. Uh, we are going to apply that two player game, a duopolis game, in a very realistic market situation. This market is about two airline producers, manufacturers, that are trying to engage in a strategic competition between each other and trying to determine how much they want to produce. The two firms in question are Boeing and Airbus. They are clearly the dominant players in the airplane manufacturing industry. So this is obviously an oligopoly market. To make things simple, we are going to start with some very simple numbers and the objective is to go beyond these numbers and understand the true nature of strategic interaction and why firms sometimes uh, you know, work or operate against their own interests. Imagine that in this particular game, uh, same rule applies. These two firms cannot communicate with each other and even if they do, that kind of communication, which is actually called a cartel, is illegal. They can face fines. Imagine that they have two strategies, either to produce three, uh, you know, either to produce airplanes at the rate, at the rate of three, uh, three units a week or four units a week. So they can either produce three airplanes or four airplanes. Simple idea. Are we all clear on this? So based on the strategies that they have, we can actually have four different combination of outcomes for our two player game. Strat you know, one outcome could be that both of them produce three airplanes per week. Both of them could produce four, four airplanes per week. And obviously there are two other combinations that are possible where airplane produces, uh, Airbus produces four while Boeing produces three. And in the fourth one is Boeing produces four, Airbus produces three. So four, four, three, three, four, three, three, four. Are we all clear on that? Two possible strategies, four possible outcomes. This is a duopolis game. Two players are playing this game. The outcomes of this game is going to be now summarized in a payoff matrix, which we saw before. Very similar strategy. Remember, in order to understand this payoff matrix, we need to understand where these players are located. Airbus Boeing is our row player, and Airbus is our column player. Payoff to Boeing is indicated by the blue lump numbers. Payment to Airbus is indicated by the red numbers. Notice that in each of these cells, they are equally divided into two parts. The lower part is for the row player, the upper part is for the column players. Do we all see that? 
the game uh, will be for, uh, played exactly the way we played the prisoner's dilemma game. Each player is going to decide what they will do, assuming what the rival will be doing. So when Boeing is deciding whether they should produce three airplane or four airplane, they are going to consider what the competitor would be doing. For example, let's imagine that Boeing thinks that Airbus is going to produce four airplane every week. So they are saying to themselves that given my com or competitor produces four airplane per week, how many airplanes should I produce? If Boeing produces four airplane as well, their profit is going to be 32 million. If they produce three airplanes, their profit is going to be 30 million. As you can see, 32 million is higher than 30. So it appears that if Airbus produces four airplane, Boeing should also produce four airplanes because that would seemingly maximize their profit. Do we all see that? In order to keep track of the choices that our players are picking, we are going to use sort of like a tick mark to identify them. So this is where Boeing is going to choose. Provided that Airbus produces four units of airplane as well. Now let's switch to the other strategy. Let's now think that Boeing assumes that Airbus is going to produce three airplane every week. So we are now on the second column. If Boeing produces four airplanes in response to Airbus's three planes per week, Boeing is going to get 40 million as profit. If Boeing produces three airplanes, they are going to get 36 million of profit. Are we all clear on this? Again, it is apparent that 40 million is higher than 36 million. So Boeing concludes that if Airbus produces three number of planes, I should produce four planes to maximize my profit. So given that Airbus chooses to produce three units of plane, Boeing is going to choose four units of plane. Now let's collect our information and, and notice that regardless of what Airbus is doing, either producing four units of airplane or three units of airplane, our Boeing is always going to stick to their four unit of production strategy. Do we all see that? When a certain player plays one strategy, regardless of what the opponent is doing, we call it a dominant strategy. Therefore, in this particular example, Boeing has a dominant strategy to produce four units. Now, let's switch to the Airbus now to see whether Airbus has any dominant strategy or not. So Airbus is going to uh, you know, think exactly like how Airbus, Boeing was thinking. So Airbus is going to think that what should I do assuming that my opponent does something. So let's say Airbus assumes that Boeing is going to produce four units of airplane every week, which means that Boeing, uh, Airbus is now going to compare either produce four units or either produce three units. So given that Boeing produces four units of airplane, this is what Airbus is going to think. Airbus is calculating these numbers. Airbus is seeing that if they produce four airplanes, they are going to get 32 million. Do we all see that? If they produce three airplanes, they are going to get 30 million with a profit. Since 32 is higher than 30, Airbus is going to pick for producing four units of airplane when, when Boeing is also producing four units of airplane. Therefore, given that Boeing produces four units of airplane, 
Airbus is going to decide to produce four units of airplane as well. Now, let's imagine that Airbus is assuming that Boeing might produce three units of airplane. Okay? If Boeing produces three units of airplane, Airbus is going to consider the possible actions that they can do. If they also produce four units of airplane, if they produce four units of airplane, they are going to get 40 million dollar worth of profit. If they produce three units of airplane, they are going to produce, they are going to get 36 units of profit. Comparing these two numbers, comparing the possible uh, benefit of these two strategies, it is clear that for Airbus, producing four units of airplane increases their uh, profit because 40 is higher than 36. Do we all see that? So, if Boeing produces three units of airplane, our Airbus is going to produce four units of airplane. As you can see that these two double tag numbers are common, which means that every time, regardless of what Boeing is doing, Airbus seems to be playing one strategy every time, which is to produce four units. Do we all see that? Since Airbus is always producing four units of airplane, regardless of what Boeing is doing, Airbus also has a dominant strategy. And the dominant strategy is to produce four units. Airbus also has a dominant strategy to produce four units of planes. Okay, so very good. We have identified the dominant strategy of each of these players. We see that when both of them has a dominant strategy to produce four units of airplane, the equilibrium is going to be both of these firms producing four units, and we are going to find the so-called Nash equilibrium in the first you know, uh, you know, sort of cell of our payoff matrix. So the Nash equilibrium, so the Nash equilibrium is that they are going to both produce four units of output, four and four. That's how we write a Nash equilibrium. The first element indicates the strategy of the row player. The second element refers to the strategy played out by the center column player. Okay, so that's the end of the game. But the analysis does not stop. It should be clear that Instead of competing with each other and finding this Nash equilibrium where both of them produces four units and earn $32 million each profit, they could have simply formed an agreement and decide to produce four units altogether and maximize their profit. Do you all see that? If they communicated, if they reached an agreement that look, let's form a pact. We, we both want to maximize profit and let's stick, look at this payoff matrix and reach a conclusion that both of us are going to produce three, I call it, three units of plane every week. So if they cooperated, if they cooperation, cooperated, they would have chosen producing lower quantity of output, three planes every week, and they could have maximized their profit. So Nash equilibrium is 4-4. Four, four. A cooperation equilibrium could be 3-3. Three, three. Unfortunately, the cooperation equilibrium will never be feasible because open, both of the firms have an incentive to cheat, just like our prisoner's dilemma problem. So this is basically a reorientation of the same prisoner's dilemma idea for which our, one of the economists got a Nobel Prize. So this kind of strategic interaction and the failure to form a collusion is evident everywhere in our real world. Does anyone have any question as to how we looked at a game, identified dominant strategy, identified Nash equilibrium, identified cooperation equilibrium and we decided how that cooperation equilibrium is not feasible because these two parties do not trust each other. Trust is a very, very important issue. 
in this kind of games and any other games in real world. Notice that if simply there were some kind of trust between these two players, if these two players trusted each other that if I want to produce three units, my opponent is also going to trust me that I am making the right decision for both of us and the opponent is also going to produce three units, they both could have benefited. Unfortunately, that does not happen. That's our first game. The next game is in a different market. We are now going to look at a, a, a very different market, a very different question, but the same application of game theory. Throughout the first part of the chapter, we have highlighted the importance of research and development. We said that research, of de research and development or product innovation was an integral part of a monopolistically competitive industries. If firms want to you know, retain and maintain their monopoly power or some kind of market power, they need to continue to invest in research and development. So now we are going to look at an R&D game. R&D game played between Pepsi and Coke. They are obviously part of a monopolistically competitive market. If you do not like the monopolistically competitive market, you can call them an oligopoly. Doesn't really matter. Okay? So, same thing, they have two strategies, either advertise or don't advertise. Since there are two players, there are four possible outcomes. One is when both of them advertise, so that's the first entry. The other possibility is that when both of them don't advertise, and between those two, there are two possible outcomes where they basically have a mismatch between their strategy. If Pepsi advertises and Coke does not advertise, this is where we are going to be. If Pepsi does not advertise but Coke does, we are going to be in the we are in the sort of like two to uh, two two one uh, in the cell of the matrix. So this is basically a two-dimensional matrix indicating the four possible outcomes that are feasible possible in this game. Take a moment to understand what we are playing. A game of R&D, these numbers are profit, two strategies for each player, four possible outcomes. Do we all say that? The game again is color coded for your convenience. In the actual exam, they are not going to be color coded. Your actual exam will have pictures that are black and white. So you need to remember what these color coding are doing for you. For each of the cells, the lower number is for the row player, the upper number is for the column player. Do we all see that? Let's now start the game. Same thought process. Pepsi is trying to think whether they should advertise or not advertise. Obviously their decision depends on what the opponent is doing. If Pepsi assumes that the opponent, Coke, is going to advertise, Pepsi is going to consider the possibility of advertising or not advertising. If they advertise, they get $20 million of worth of profit. If they don't advertise, they get minus 20, uh, 10 million. That's a negative number. That's a loss. We all see that. So for Pepsi, if Coke advertises, it is obviously beneficial for them to advertise as well. Do we all see that? I'm going to again use the tick mark. Please remember, this is a very useful strategy because sometimes you can get confused. So, the first tick mark is the strategy that Pepsi will choose if they assume that Coke is going to advertise. If Coke does not advertise, Pepsi has to think about the possible benefits of advertising or not advertising. If they advertise when Coke is not, they are going to get 80 million. And if they don't advertise, they get 50 million. 80 million is greater than 50 million. So given that Coke does not advertise, Pepsi will surely advertise. Do you all see that? So given that Coke does not advertise, Pepsi is definitely going to advertise. And therefore, we find, again, a dominant strategy by Pepsi. Pepsi has a dominant strategy. 
and the dominant strategy is to advertise now let's switch the game think about what coke is thinking and what coke is doing and what coke would do coke would do the same thing they are going to make assumption about what the opponent is doing and then make their decision imagine that coke assumes that pepsi is going to advertise if pepsi advertises and coke advertises coke gets 20 million if pepsi advertises and coke does not advertise coke get minus 10 million so obviously it is more profitable for coke to advertise when pepsi is advertising so assuming that pepsi advertises coke will advertise as well now imagine that coke is assuming that pepsi does not advertise so if pepsi does not advertise coke get two possible outcomes if they advertise when pepsi is not they get 80 million if they don't advertise when pepsi is also not advertising they get 50 million 80 million is greater than 50 million so if coke assumes that pepsi is not going to advertise coke is going to advertise definitely you all see that again we have found this double tick marks on a singular strategy which appears that coke is going to advertise regardless of what the opponent is going to do so that means our coke has a dominant strategy as well the dominant strategy of coke is to advertise as well since both of these players have a dominant strategy it is easy to see that the nash equilibrium is when both of them advertise I, I, I hope that you see that whenever I am writing the Nash equilibrium, I am, I am writing the Nash equilibrium in terms of strategies and not payoffs. Do you all see that? I am not writing the profits associated with these strategies. I am just mentioning their strategies because Nash equilibrium is not equilibrium in outcome but equilibrium in strategies. So Nash equilibrium is that both of them advertise so we are stuck with the first entry of this payoff matrix. When both advertise in the equilibrium, both of them uh, gets the profit worth of $20 million. Is this the best that they can do? No. If they cooperate and don't advertise, both of them could end up here and almost doubling their profit. Do we all see that? So, if they cooperate, if they cooperate, they could have significantly improve their profit by not advertising at all unfortunately just like the previous two games the prisoners dilemma game and the airbus going game that cooperation outcome is impossible because they do not trust each other they are always going to cheat you know if they reach an agreement both of them will deviate from that and that's the basic and the most important lesson that i am trying to cover and convey in this part of the chapter any question about the game again finding dominant strategy finding nash equilibrium finding cooperation equilibrium and understanding why the cooperation equilibrium is not going to be feasible The last game is an actual R&D game. I apologize, the previous game was advertisement, but the, you know, the, it doesn't really matter what kind of game we are playing. We are trying to understand why this kind of games are all identical. So this is the R&D example. Uh, the previous example was an advertisement, which is also important. So this is now uh, two firms, Procter & Gamble, Kimberly, Carl Clark. These are manufacturing giants that are trying to decide whether they want to uh, yeah, invest in R&D or not. 
So I'm going to be quicker in this time because I hope by now we have sufficient human capital to understand how this is going to play out. So when Kibrati is trying to figure out whether they should invest on R&D or not, they are going to think what the opponent is doing. If the opponent Procter and Gamble at you know invest in research and development, it makes sense for Kimberly to max you know invest in R&D as well because five million is higher than minus ten million. If they you know invest in R&D, they get five million. If they do not invest in R&D, they get negative number. So given that Procter and Gamble is going to invest in R&D. Kimberly is also going to invest in R&D. Given that Procter and Gamble does not invest in R&D, we compare 85 million with 30 million, and we find that Kimberly will also will will continue to invest in R&D. So, just like we did before, we will find that in both of the possible uh, in a strategy undertaken by the opponent. Kimberly appears to be having a dominant strategy. They are going to invest in R&D regardless of what the opponent is doing. For the Procter and Gamble case now, if Kimberly invests in R&D, Procter and Gamble considers the profit of investing in R&D which is 45 and the profit of not investing in R&D which is negative 10 million. 45 million is higher than minus 10 million so they will surely invest in R&D so that is for Procter and Gamble strategy assuming that Kimberly invests in R&D as well if Kimberly does not invest in R&D Procter and Gamble will compare the payoff between investing and not investing investing gives them some 85 million dollar profit not investing in R&D gives them 70 million dollar of profit. So it appears that our column player Procter and Gamble also has a dominant strategy in investing in R&D. Since we have a combination where both of them are playing their dominant strategy, this will be the Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium would be both of these firms investing in R&D. Is this the best they can do? No. If they don't invest, both of them could have moved to no investment on strategy combination and Procter and uh, Kimberly could have received 30 million dollar, which is higher than the profit that they could have earned in the Nash equilibrium. Procter and Gamble would have received 70 million, which is higher than the profit that they would have received in Nash equilibrium. So the cooperation equilibrium, just like the prisoner's dilemma, increases the benefit of the players. Unfortunately, that is not feasible because these two players do not trust each other and they cheat. <coughs> I'm going to pause for a minute and I will see whether you have any question on how, given a game, how you can find strategies played by these players, find Nash equilibrium, find dominant strategy, find cooperation equilibrium, and understand how and why the cooperation equilibrium are not feasible. That concludes our chapter 13. This is a fairly large chapter, which it, it took us about, uh, you know, more than a week to finish this, and that's fine. I am going to upload the next quiz and the next homework from chapter 13 in my phone lab today. Since you will be required to study a lot for this particular chapter, I will make the deadline on Sunday. Sunday. So you have a very long window. But my recommendation would be to try to finish this chapter as quickly as possible. And then take the quiz because you want to you know, you know, take some time off for yourself during the weekend. So if there is no question, yes please. So we just went over like three games and they all had like the same strategic playing with the domestic. 
domain of dominion strategy, right? Is there any difference between that, like between the games? Because I know they were titled differently, but is there any questions? You That's a see? very, very good question. It appears that for all the games that we have played so far, each player had a dominion strategy. They were hit on it. They were always willing to play only one strategy, right? That made our life quite easy because all we had to do is figure out what the opponent is continuously going to do. In real life and in more advanced economic sports, you might not have dominant strategy for a farm. And in that case, you are going to have to find Nash equilibrium just like we showed in the previous class where you figure out my strategy as response to your strategy and if that strategy is consistent with your strategy in response to my strategy, we will have a strategy, uh, Nash equilibrium in strategies. And I will not ask you questions like that. So the questions that you are going to uh, have in the final exam and in the, uh, in the next exam and in the quiz and in the homework will systematically have dominant strategies. So your uh, job while you are looking at these problems would be to try to first find dominant strategies by these firms. It will significantly make your life easier. That's a good question. Uh, any other question that I can address? Okay, so I am now of formally moving to the macro part of this course. And the macro part of this course is characterized by two things. First of all, lots and lots of reading. Lots and lots of reading, number one. These are, so we are going to cover about six chapters. The numbers do not really you know, mean anything, you might seem that well, we're probably going to cover like four chapters. We have more than a month, actually at, at, uh, less than a month, and we should be able to do that. It might seem that we are sticking with each of these chapters for too long, but please re remember that there is a reason why we are doing this. We are going to cover as many chapters as we can, but the objective is not to cover too many materials, too much materials. The objective is to cover the materials in the way that we can understand and apply. These are challenging chapters. So it is very important that you go home and you know study the materials one more time to, to basically have these ideas ingrained in your thought process. That's issue number one. Issue number two is that for this particular chapter, chapter 14, I will be using several supplemental materials. And it, would, it is very important that while you are reading and preparing for this chapter for the upcoming quizzes, you refer back to the class lectures that we covered because they are going to be recorded to you. I will be using three different supplemental materials to cover chapter 14 and I will upload all of them. But it will be your responsibility to remember what materials were taken from what particular supplemental material. So, with that dire warning, let us start our chapter 14. Our chapter 14 is basically the introduction to principles of macroeconomics, basically. And in macroeconomics, our objective is, is to understand macroeconomic issues. So far, we were always interested in or confined to microeconomic questions. What happens when the price of one good changes and how does that change the economy? What happens when your income changes and how does that change the market for one economy or one country or for one good? If we were talking about markets as if the whole economy is confined to that one market. Obviously, that's not true because our economy is a much more complicated base. There are millions of different kinds of markets all coming together, all playing a role in the overall you know, situation of our economy. So our macro approach from now till the end of this chapter course is going to be trying to understand the forest. So far we have been looking at trees, now we are going to start looking at the forest. The first chapter that we are introducing in the discussion of macroeconomy is to understand how this economy works. In that process, we are going to introduce a concept that we are going to use to measure the overall output of an economy. Because that is an important idea. Because 
even if the macroeconomy is more complicated than the microeconomy, even if the macroeconomy consists of a lot of microeconomy inside it, at the end of the day, our macroeconomy should not be very different from the microeconomy. If we are thoroughly successful, towards the end of this course, I will show you a macro model of demand and supply that looks very similar to the micro model of demand and supply. But going there requires, uh, you know, spending four chapters, at least four chapters, and understand the true functioning of the macroeconomy. So in this chapter, we are going to introduce this idea called gross domestic product or GDP. It will take us two class you know, worth of time to simply explain what GDP is and more importantly, how do you measure the GDP of an economy? As a, con as a you know, sort of you know, citizen of a country like USA, you are probably all familiar with this term GDP, which is called gross domestic product. We are going to formally analyze and understand what that is, what that includes and what that does not include. As a convention, instead of defining GDP, I'm going to start with a different point of introduction. From a supplemental material, I want to start my discussion of GDP by looking at the circular flow diagram one more time. And this time, paying attention to not only the structure of the economy, but also to understand how the flow chart, flow circular flow diagram summarizes all the macroeconomic activities. If you remember, the circular flow diagram was a simplification of the actual economy, which divided the economy into two groups, households and firms, and divided all the markets of the economy into product market or market for goods and services and the markets for factors of production. <coughs> Do you all remember that? But our approach now will be to look at the circular flow diagram with a macro flavor to it, with a macro focus to it. The reason why this, uh, this model is called a circular flow diagram is because it shows how all the economic activities flow in a circular fashion. Let's now look at these flows and try to understand how these flows are being generated. We have already done that before, but this time there will be a macro focus to it, and I will explain what that means. We can start with any of our favorite player in this cycle of flow diagram. Let's say I, you know, we start with households because all of us are households. So what's the role of the household? Households basically play two important roles in this market in this circular flow diagram. They supply factors of production, labor, land, and capital to firms in the market for factors of production. So in the market for factors of production, our households are suppliers. As you can see, these arrows are extremely important. Households are also the buyers or purchasers or consumers of goods and services they buy from the factory from the product market or market for goods and services. So households are buyers in the goods and services market, sellers in the factory market. Our firms on the other hand are buyers of these factors of production from the factory market which are being sold by our households and they are the sellers of goods and services in the market for goods and services where the household buys these things from them. So clearly, there is a circular flow of resources and physical goods in this economy. There are flow of services, raw materials that goes from households to firms, and those resources are purchased by firms as factors of production. They take those factors of production, produce something, sell that in the market for goods and services. This is the true nature of any economy. Resources owned by households, 
get translate transformed into output sold in the market which are again bought by the household that is how the circular flow diagram operates do we all see the flow of these resources through the inner circular flow that are color coded again by red color now beyond this flow of resources and goods there is another flow and this flow is on in terms of financial resources money money and income whenever the household sells these factors of production to firms in this market factor market labor land and capital our households receive payment for this for labor our households will pay get paid wage for land our households will get pure rent and for capital our households will receive payment such as called rent rent and pure rent are very common terms in economics in economics rent and that's not the rent not only the rent that you pay for your house it also is the payment for any capital that you use in your production process so if you uh, borrow this computer from the university and you pay a fee for that service that service is also rent these form these wages pure rent and rent form the basis of income for our households they become the income of the households which the households take and spend it in the market for goods and services makes sense so i work in the factory market earn income and take that income and spend that in the market for final goods and services do you all agree so now we are focusing on the outer flow the blue outer circular flow where resources financial resources by the way wages pure rent rent these are all dollars right money do you all see that these are not physical goods you cannot keep them you cannot use them in the production process so the income of the households therefore becomes the spending by households in the market for factors of in the final goods and services in the product market income of the household from the factory market becomes the spending by the households in the market for goods and services now this spending also becomes the revenue of the firms because they sell them these items to the households do we all see that revenue is what you earn by selling stuff and the revenue is basically spending by household on the other side of the market do we all see that so what do firms do with this revenue do they keep all the revenue for themselves they cannot right because their these revenues were earned by selling goods that from sold in the market but those goods production required also costs and those costs were paid by the revenue and those costs were wages rent profit is not a good word i'm going to cut that and i'm going to call rent pure rent do you all see that so the wage rent and pure rent that households receive are being paid by firms and the source of these factor payment by firm is the revenue they earn from the households right so it seems it seems like they are connected right the income of the household is the spending by the firm the income of the firm the revenue is the spending by the household do we all see that this seems like a very simplistic view of the macroeconomy i can assure you this is probably the most simplest yet the most accurate depiction of a macroeconomy this is how the macroeconomy works before we use this model to characterize our macroeconomy we need to remind ourselves that this particular model is missing some key players in our macroeconomy players without which we cannot understand how a macroeconomy works what are we missing
What are we missing? Um, rest of the world, because not everybody. No, so the production of the goods that firms produce are not bought by the consumers of the economy. Not all of it. At least part of the production by the firms go to the rest of the world. You're right. What else are we missing? What major player are we missing from our macroeconomy without which this cycle of flow diagram is incomplete? Yeah. Very good. We're also missing another very important player. Now, before we talk about that player, we need to understand the role of the government. I hope that you appreciate the fact that in this circle of flow diagram, everyone is connected with everyone. That's how the, that's basically the nature of the circle of flow diagram. Otherwise, it would not be a circle of flow. So if there is a player in this market, that player also has to be connected with everyone else in the economy. And the government is a clearly connected with everyone, right? Government uh, is going to collect tax from the household. Notice that the flow of the arrow is going from household and going to the government. Do we all see that? The government is going to collect tax from the firms. Again, the flow is from the firm to the government. Government is also going to give some stuff to the household. That's called transfer payments. For the time being, we're just going to call them TR. Later on, I'm going to define that. Government is going to give stuff to the firms as well. We are going to call them subsidy. Do we all, do you all agree? So, in this very simple extended form of the circle of flow diagram, we see clearly how government is at the heart of our macroeconomy. Right? So if government is at the heart of this macroeconomy, the inclusion of the government is very relevant. What else should we add? Something else, something very important thing is missing. Thanks. Now, I want you to think about banks not as banks, but as institutions. Institutions are an important part of the macroeconomy. There are a lot of institutions without which this macroeconomy will not survive. And there are a lot of institutions which are neither farm, nor household, nor even the government. Are we all clear on that? This could be institutions that serves the foundation of a macroeconomy. And one of those institutions, probably the most important one, is a bank. Now you might argue that, well, a bank is, it could be a private sector institution, and they most, almost always are, at least in USA. And a bank should therefore be treated just like a firm, right? Because it's a private entity, they are obviously profit maximizers. They satisfy all the, all the requirement for being a firm because that's what a firm do. They produce, they sell, they earn profit. Does a bank do all of this? The answer is yes, with some exceptions, and the exceptions are important. The difference between a bank and GM is that GM produces stuff, a bank also produces stuff, and, then the, and there is a substantial difference. The stuff that GM produces, you can use them. You can eat them, just in, in, liter, in, in a, in a non-literal sense. Are we all clear on that? They are for your personal use. But the, but the good that bank produces, you cannot really eat them. They are a piece of paper. So there's a difference between bank and traditional other firms 
A bank provides you services which are sometimes what we call non-tangible goods. Goods that you cannot see but can enjoy. Also, banks provide you and offer you services that you really cannot use, like eat for yourself. So there is a physical difference between the service that the firm produces and the bank produces. This seems very, you know, sort of narrow view of the bank, but this is how I want you guys to think about them from a very foundational perspective. Rather than thinking about banks as a regular firm, I would like you to think about bank as an intermediary, like a middleman, because almost all the activities that banks do actually are intermediary or middleman activities. For example, let's say you put some money in a bank, which we are going to talk about, definitely, which will be called savings. What does the bank do with that money? The bank probably lends that to someone, and almost always that someone is probably a firm, an entrepreneur, who needs capital, who needs money to buy the machines, pay for the workers, buy the piece of land. So notice that although the money is being given by the bank to the firm, the source of those resources are actually the household. Do we all see that? So basically the bank is a middleman between the household and the firm. Make sense? Now, does that mean, does that make the role of the bank trivial? Obviously not. Absolutely not. Because sometimes being a middleman could be the most important thing that a bank can do. And in modern day, banks do even more than that. And towards the end of this you know, course, probably the second to the last chapter, we're going to talk about banks. Okay. This is just the introduction to this chapter. Okay, so with, the, with that introduction, we can, the, the most important thing that now we can take out of this is that in this economy, there appears to be some concepts that we use regularly in our traditional language that are, appear to be identical terms, like income, like spending, like revenue. Right? One would never think that the income of the household is somehow equal to the revenue of the firms, but then think again. In this simple world, they are basically identical because revenue comes from production, income comes from using the factors that are used in the production process, right? Do you all see that? So if a firm is earning zero economic profit, the revenue that they earn basically gets spent on paying for the factors of production, which becomes the income of the household. Do we all see that? So before we leave this particular chapter, I would like you guys to re write this very important, very, very important equation. In our macroeconomy, the income of the economy is going to be equal to the expenditure of the economy it is also going to be equal to the production of the economy because production generates revenue. If we believe that the income of the economy is equal to the expenditure of the economy, is equal to the production of the economy, we will now discuss the possible ways of calculating GDP. Let's now define GDP and you will see immediately why I have written this equation. I'm now going to switch back to, my, to our actual material and we are going to now spend a substantial amount of seemingly unreasonable time to define our GDP. The reason why I'm going to spend so much time is that in the actual exam there are going to be multiple questions coming from the definition of GDP. If you want to play safe, simply memorize the definition that I'm about to explain. GDP, gross domestic product. It is the market value of all the final goods and services produced within a country in a given time period. I'm going to read the definition one more time. GDP 
is the market value of all the final goods and services produced within a country in, in a given time period. There are some definitions in economics which I call loaded definitions, meaning that these are definitions where every word in the definition matters. You need to understand every word of the definition of GDP. Let's now do that. The first important part is called the value, market value, right? Does everything have a market value? Does everything have a market value? What has a market value? Can anyone tell me? No, what has a market value? What has a market value? What can have a market value? It has a very simple answer. Anything that is sold in a marketplace has a market value, right? Does that mean that everything is sold in the marketplace? You're, one of you saying is no. Why? Can you give me an example of a good that is not sold in the marketplace? How about your sense of security? I could have started with love, but that's a different <laughs> story and we don't want to go there. <laughs> so your defense does not have a market value because you don't really pay for it. We all see that. Now you might argue that, well, you know, I do pay taxes and that taxes are being paid to, you know, hire the military or provide this security service for me. But does that really mean that you are paying for your security? If that was the case, a person living in China would have been the most safe, you know, the safest person in the world, right? Because the government spends so much money. Do you really feel safe in China or in Saudi Arabia? Safety is a psychological issue, it's a sociological issue. How much money you say you spend on safety or security does not really guarantee that. Do we all see that? So not every good that is essential to our life is, has a market value. Number one. Now are all markets same? That is no. There are basically two kinds of markets. Markets that are legal and markets that are not legal. Some of the goods that you can buy from both of these markets at the same time, but if you buy that goods from an illegal market, your good does not really have a market value. And we need to understand that before we move forward. So this is a very un unorthodox way of introducing our GDP or this chapter, but I would like to do this because this is how I think we understand about the world. Okay. okay, so we have used the word underground economy, probably seen the usage of the word underground economy many, many times in our life. When we think about the underground economy, the first thing that comes to our mind is the sale and purchase of illicit drugs, human trafficking, things like that. So these are so we have a decent understanding about what the underground economy is. We know that underground economy is an economy that is not controlled by the government. This is a market where the goods and services that are bought and sold are uh, prohibited by the government. Every government has a list of stuff that you can sell in a regular market. Can you buy an atomic bomb from a market? Uh, no, two of you said no. Why? Okay, who says that? Yes, and that's a very, very important consideration. So it is the government who determines whether a market is a legal market or an illegal market. The, I'm going to talk about the implication in a minute. So government, every country, the government has a list of stuff that is prohibited from selling or purchasing from a marketplace. And you can see why this is important, because in many countries, some of the goods that are considered illegal in this country are legal. There are countries where the average uh, age for cons uh, alcohol consumption is 15. There are countries where the average age 
Average legal age for alcohol consumption is 12. Right? So you can see clearly that this is entirely determined by the government. In USA, if a 15-year-old tries to buy con alcohol, alcoholic beverages from a market, that would be illegal. Do we all agree? Okay, why is this, why, why are we starting to talk about the government to begin with? Because government determines what is illegal and what is legal. Now, let's look at the implication. Let's say you have a burger joint that you are, you know, uh, on the street, you have seen all these portable, you know, burger places that sells burger to you and they don't have a license. So the stuff that they're selling is legal, purely legal, right? You know, you can buy the burger from McDonald's as opposed to buying the burger from you. It's not illicit drugs. It's not human trafficking, right? But if this guy doesn't have a license, which means the government has not given him authorization to sell burger on the marketplace, and hence, if you buy the burger from his store, that portable mobile store, that will also be part of the underground economy. Do you agree? So, if you buy a burger from the portable burger joint that doesn't have a government license, it doesn't have a market value. It's an illegal good. Okay? Let's go back. So, we are going to use the market price to determine the market value of a good, period. We will assume that whatever price you pay for your cell phone is the market value of your cell phone. We are no longer in the microeconomic domain. We don't care about your utility, we don't care about your willingness to pay. We know all of these matters, but not for us anymore. Are we all clear on that? Market price? is going to be considered the true valuation of the good. Um, production is the main thing that GDP is trying to capture. GDP wants to understand what the economy is producing. Because later on, we are going to see why and how this GDP number is used. The importance of GDP number will be to give you a gauge about how the economy is doing, how the country is doing compared to other countries, how the country is doing now as opposed to the in the past. So you need a number, uh, a number to give you a feedback on that. And that number is our GDP. It is basically trying to capture the production aspect of the economy. So the GDP calculation in the definition says includes only the value of final goods and services. What does that mean? Final goods and services are goods and services that, that you can buy from the store, take home, and start consuming. It could, be a, it could be a car, it could be a can of milk, it could be cheese as well. The reason why we talk about final good is because in the macroeconomy, there are other goods that are not final goods. They are called intermediary goods. Intermediary goods are goods and services produced by one firm, brought by another firm, and used as a component of a final good and services. The definition seems straightforward, and some of the examples also look kind of make sense. The tire of your car is an intermediate good. Because it is used to produce a car, which is a final good, so anything that is used to produce that final good is an intermediary good, right? Make sense? We, so flour would be an intermediary good to cake. You buy cake, take it home and start eating it. So that's the final good. Anything that is used to produce that cake is an intermediary good. But that is not the, but the analysis is not that simple, right? Sugar is the intermediary good in that cake, right? But a lot of us like to eat sugar by itself. Isn't that right? If you think about Bridgestone, the uh, uh, giant tire manufacturing company, for them, the final good that they produce and sell in the market is a final good. Right? For them, it's a final good. Do you see that? So when you are calculating GDP, when you are calculating GDP, should you calculate the value of the car and the value of the tire produced by Bridgestone in the GDP calculation, or should you only be calculating the value of the car? 
Are we all clear on the question? Are we all clear on the question? What is your answer? Why? Okay, so the term that you just used, and, and I'm, I'm really glad that you did, is called double counting. Please write it down. Double counting is a serious macroeconomic problem where you sometimes calculate the value of a good twice. And if you do that, notice that the number that you are calculating for GDP is not the real number. It, is, it gives you, uh, you know, a misperception about how the economy is producing. In order to avoid double counting, we do not include the intermediary good. Because if you do, you will be calculating the value of the car, uh, the value of the tire twice, and you don't want to do that. I can guarantee you that a question like this in, is in the upcoming exam. Yes, please. That's a very, very good question. A heating or a utility is a service that you purchase and enjoy, and utility is a final good. Right? But the natural gas that is used to uh, provide you with utility is an intermediate good. Right? So if you are paying an electricity bill, you don't really care about how that electricity bill is being produced. So you are only paying for the service, and that is a very important part of the GDP calculation because it's an important part of your final goods and services calculation. Okay, um, where the good is produced is extremely important in the in the definition. Everything that is produced within the country is considered part of GDP, which means that our GDP has a very strong border element to it. I'm running out of time today. When we come back on the next class, we are going to show you another concept where border becomes irrelevant. But before we go, timing is very important. Usually GDP is calculated uh, for a given period of time, usually three months in actual data and in our classroom data for a year. Every year, the country is going to calculate the GDP number. Any question before we leave today? Please, you know, uh, use your time wisely on chapter 13. Chapter 13 is very long. I'm going to upload the chapter summary, in-class problem set, uh, and the sample quiz. Please take a look at them and then attend the quiz and the homework. And as I mentioned, I will make the due date for this quiz on Sunday. Sunday. Now, I receive a lot of emails where people say that they forgot about the quiz and the homework. Starting from this quiz, I'm not going to make any exception. So please, uh, as soon as you get the email, start preparing and finish the quiz and the homework.